Hello, good afternoon, good evening, or good morning from the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva. Happy World Health Day. Today is 7 of April. It's the birthday of the World Health Organization. And this is the day when we use the opportunity to remind everyone that um, the he that health is a human right for everyone. Um, the theme of the, this year's campaign is health equity, and I'm very pleased to be joined by our health equity experts, uh, Theodora Koller. She's a senior uh, health equity officer. Good afternoon, Theodora. Good afternoon. Yes, pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have you with us. And we have Kumanan. Uh, Razanathan, who is a unit uh, head of the health and equity team, who is joining us today from New Zealand, from the middle in, of the night. So thank you, Kumanan, so much for being with us today. Yes, um, uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning, and it's a pleasure to be here. Happy World Health Day to both of you and congratulations on, on working on, on this campaign. Um, I would remind our viewers who are watching us on Twitter to ask their questions by using the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, please ask your questions via comment section. Um, and while we are waiting for questions to arrive, the Theodora and Kumanan, I'd like maybe to ask you to uh, share a little bit about your career um, and your work in WHO with, with our viewers and uh, as an introduction on this theme of, of health equity today. Theodora, would you like to start? Ladies first. Okay, sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I started actually with WHO in 2002. Uh, and before that, I was working with uh, NGOs and academia, um, some in Latin America, um, mostly looking at issues related to poverty and sustainable development. Um, and uh, since I've been with WHO, I've uh, worked in relation to the determinants of health with a focus on, on the actions needed to address the, the determinants of health equity. Uh, I've worked on social inclusion in health. I've worked on ethnic minority health. I've worked on migration and health. Uh, I've worked in the European region quite a bit. Um, uh, in, and then uh, in addition, I've worked in the India country office for WHO. And I've been at, at HQ at working across countries globally for the last six years. Thank you, Theodora. Very, very rich experience and the variety of countries you've been working in. So we are looking forward to hear more uh, today about it. Uh, Kumanan, what is um, your career pathway to where you are uh, with us today? Uh, so I'm a public health doctor, um, public health physician. Um, I also did a degree in politics. And then after working for a few years in clinical medicine, I worked in a few remote places, including as an emergency doctor. Uh, I then entered public health and uh, worked uh, in, in, in New Zealand for, for several years, including on um, meningococcal vaccine clinical trials. And um, I worked on the 2006 uh, first New Zealand pandemic influenza action plan, um, then worked in, in China for a while, and then joined WHO in, in 2007, working on primary health care and social determinants of health, which we'll talk a bit more about today. Uh, and then since then, I, I worked at UNICEF, mostly working around uh, delivering child health services in, in Asia and Africa. For the past three years, I've been working in Cambodia on health systems and maternal and child health. For the past year, really working on COVID. And I've uh, just recently started this new job in Geneva back working on uh, social determinants of health and health equity. Thank you very much. We are already receiving some questions from our viewers. Thank you very much. But just before we, we start answering all of these, um, I said at the beginning, um, this is today is the chance to remind everyone that health is a human right. So what do we mean by that? What is actually right to health? Great. I'll, I'll take that. Please. <laughs> Yeah, I just I wanted to start out by saying that um, in, in really commemorating the foundation of WHO, I want to refer back to the, the 1946 constitution of WHO, and it explicitly stated that the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social position. Um, 
and uh, and it, and uh, I'd also like to add it. It should have highlighted gender then as well. <laughs> but um, it, WHO the, in our constitution, it was really the first time that the the right to health was uh, articulated globally. And the right to health looks at, of course, uh, ensuring the AAQ. And what we mean by that is the availability, the accessibility. Uh, and when I when I say accessibility, I mean financially and geographically accessible health services, acceptable and quality health services. So the AAQ with regard to health services, but in addition, the right to health also looks at the underlying determinants of health. And so we were talking about drinking water, sanitation, nutrition, housing, gender equality, access to information. These are all really fundamental components. So we both, we wanna act on uh, ensuring use, universal health coverage and action that are the underlying conditions for health. Uh, so those are those are core components. In addition, the right to health really uh, highlights entitlements, and that's important because it looks at a, that that each person would be entitled to uh, to a health system that enables them to attain the highest level of health possible, and also they are entitled to participate in decision making regarding their health. Thank okay. you, thank you so much, Tedora. Kumanan, can you tell us more about social determinants of health and all these different factors? How do they impact people's health? And how do we know that? How do we measure that? So I think when a lot of people think about health, they think about health care. They think about going to doctors and nurses and hospitals. And of course, that's very, very important. We're seeing that with the current COVID pandemic. But health is much more than health care. And we know from the science, from the evidence, that the health sector is very important, but other sectors are very important. The, the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and their access to power, money, and resources. And they're fundamental to creating health, to protecting health. So yes, as I, as I always say, for example, in child health, it's very important who gets vaccinated, do you get the right vaccination at the right time, are they of good quality? But it's also very important that people's parents have good education. In fact, I always used to say it's just as important about the quality and the coverage of adolescent girls' education to reduce um, under five children dying as it is child immunisation. So education, what job you do, do you live in safe working conditions? Are you in poverty? Do you have enough income to meet your basic needs? Do you live in with clean air, with clean water? Do you have sanitation? Can you exercise? Can you obtain nutritious food? All of these things are fundamental to your health. And so there's, there's no point debating what's more important between the health sector or other sectors. We need the health sector to do its job, but we also need people to have access to the social determinants of health, to be able to make decisions over their lives, to, to really benefit from education, good social services, so that people can have the foundation of health to pursue the lives they aspire to. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here is the question that we received immediately as we started going live from Dr. Rahul Pal, who is watching us on LinkedIn. How can we build fairer and better health during pandemic? Well, the pandemic has really sort of exposed how unequal our society world is. It's the virus exploits the weaknesses in our societies and it affects those most who uh, have already have unfair and unequal chances for health. So that's why we've seen all these inequities in terms of the pandemic. Some of them are new, linked to access to diagnostics, to treatments, to vaccines, that's, that's most visible. Um, we know, for example, that currently about 86% of vaccinations have occurred in high-income countries and only 0.1% in low-income countries. That's unfair, that's unacceptable, but it's much more than that. Uh, the pandemic has exacerbated inequalities. It's driven probably 120 million people last year into extreme poverty because of the social and economic impacts. There's been differences in who dies, who gets infected, who needs to be hospitalized according to where people live, what ethnicity they are, what job they do. 
So if we want to address these inequities, and that's why today at WHO we're calling for everyone to join us in building a fairer and a healthier world. The theme of World Health Day is health equity, and that's the campaign for this year. And there, 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 there are several things we can do. Firstly, for the pandemic, obviously a clear thing that, that WHO is advocating for is that we need to have vaccine equity. We need to ensure that it doesn't matter where you live or what ethnicity you, you are as to whether you can access a vaccine. And that's something clearly we have a lot of work to do that's very, very important. But it's not just vaccines, it's access to oxygen, it's access to testing. We, we need that to be much more equitable. And that's so important because as we say, no one is safe until we're all safe. So it's not just the right thing to do, but if we want to overcome the pandemic, we need much more, much more equitable access to health services. But it's more than that. And what we've seen is that a lot of governments have tried to buffer the sort of social and economic impacts of COVID through sort of social welfare schemes to cash transfer schemes. And many governments are putting in place things that probably before the pandemic sometimes were thought of as uh, politically unfeasible, not possible. So, so the governments are trying, but we are still very much seeing these unequal impacts. So we we need to put in place policies to stop people falling into po to poverty. We need to really look at the experience of children in our schools. We're seeing too often in many countries that wealthier children, better off children are getting much better experience and still being able to go to school in person, whereas poorer children, more marginalised children, uh, are not being able to go to school, aren't having access to online sort of school experiences. We are really worried about malnutrition, about the way that people have access to regular health services. And so we, to, if we want to, to build a fairer world, we need to put equity at the heart of the COVID-19 response, but we also need to put equity at the heart of everything we do. And we do have lessons from a number of countries about what's possible. We have the science on, we know what to do, but we really need to put those policies in place and we need everybody to contribute to make that happen. Thank you, Kumanan, very much. And this year's World Health Day is, uh, theme is health equity. And Kumanan just mentioned that we need equity to be at the heart of the COVID-19 response and everything we do uh, in global health. So, Theodora, maybe you can uh, tell us more about this campaign and uh, what is health equity? What do we mean by saying health equity? Yeah, sure. So, uh, health inequities are really unfair, uh, unjust, and remediable differences in health. And that's the key word, that they're remediable. They can be changed. Um, and health inequities will evolve and emerge uh, based on, let's say, different differentials. We have differentials in exposure to risk factors, differential in, in vulnerability to risk factors, differential access to quality health services across the full continuum, um, differential health outcomes, and then also differential consequences as a result of using services. And so just to kind of walk you all through this with regards to um, risk factors, differential exposure to risk factors, we know uh, in the COVID-19 context that there are certain occupations, uh, there are certain living conditions, uh, and, and th these will influence, for example, the extent to which a person is exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, with regards to differential vulnerability to the risk factors, um, that can be due to something like a comorbidity. Um, it can be due to, uh, let's say, um, the, uh, the consolidated, accumulated uh, exposure to multiple risks at once. Um, and then also uh, with regards to differential access to quality health services, you live in a rural remote area, very much building on what Kumanan said, it might be very challenging to get the testing, uh, to get access to the, if you have a severe manifestation of the disease in ICU unit, um, you know, to get then actually access to the vaccinations if the vaccination centers are in the, the urban centers. Um, so you'll see that inequities can emerge, uh, you know, in exposure, vulnerability, access to health services, we see them manifest in health outcomes uh, with, with the most deprived, deprived populations being worst hit. And then with regards to consequences, we're looking at things like um, catastrophic impoverishing health expenditures because somebody's had to pay out of pocket 
for services and they couldn't afford it, um, stigmatization. Uh, these are all manifestations of health inequities. And I think uh, while that may have science sounded very scientific, when it, when it comes down to, um, you know, just really how, how you would uh, talk about it in, in, a, in a family, in an informal context, it's, it's simple things. Inequities are simple things like at the end of the month, you know, having no food in your cupboard or uh, being a mother and wanting to take your sick child into the healthcare services, but not being able to because you can't afford it or being a woman and feeling ill, but not being able to uh, go and to look for health services because you have to ask your, your husband and maybe he won't give you permission to go. It's, these are, these are all manifestations of health inequities. And, uh, these are the, I've mentioned some of the barriers that can drive those health inequities. Um, so that's, that's really what essentially we're getting at with the, the World Health Day campaign. And we have different asks that we have put forth um, to try to, um, let's say, raise the awareness amongst policymakers and amongst all the general public of what can be done. And the first ask is uh, really uh, for everyone to be committed to equitable access to vaccines, tests, treatments, and services for COVID-19 within between countries. The second is to strengthen health information systems and invest in better inequality data. The third is to protect and prioritize health budgets, including in stimulus planning uh, and longer term recover plans. The fourth is to ensure equitable access to services and infrastructure needed to address the environmental and social determinants of health in both urban and rural areas. And the fifth is to strengthen primary health care as the foundation of every health system and really champion this concept that we call progressive universalism. That means that in reforms towards UHC, the most disadvantaged populations should benefit at least as, but ideally more so than the more advantaged uh, populations. Thank you, Theodora. You at the same time answered another question from our viewer uh, on LinkedIn who asked, what are the interventions needed for fairer and better world? And now you, you listed all the five asks um, that we, we, we actually launched for this World Health Day for countries to do. Um, Kumanan Theodora told us what are health inequities and gave us some examples. But who is the most uh, affected by health inequities and, and why? So the people who are worst affected by health inequities are the people who have the, the worst access to health care and the people who have the worst social determinants, so the worst living conditions. Um, so they're often people in poverty. They're people who face discrimination because of their ethnicity or their gender or their sexual identity or because they have a disability or because of their education level or where they live. Um, and often that's not just interpersonal, that's not just discrimination at the individual level, but it's actually that systems either explicitly or implicitly are, are set up in a way that they, they discriminate. Um, I think we had a lot of discussion this year in many countries on, on structural racism, that's an example. So these are people who are discriminated against, often excluded from being able to benefit from the way we set up our societies. Some, often it's people who are not even counted Right. For example, undocumented migrants who are worried about presenting to social systems because they're worried that they'll be uh, expelled from countries. We talked about this today, this today in the webinar earlier. So it's really often people who are at the margins of, their, of our societies. And, and this is not a natural thing. This isn't about things intrinsic to those people. This is about the way we set up our societies, about the choices that we make as societies and that sadly some people really really miss out and so just to add to what theodora said in terms of what we need to do the most challenging thing we need to do about health inequities and why they're very difficult is that to close these gaps we need to ensure that people who are worse off people who in societies aren't as well off or don't have as good position that they improve faster that they get better access to resources to services than people who are better off, who often have more political power. So that's politically difficult, but it's actually in all of our interests. 
And it is possible. We, we, ha we have seen um, a number of countries do that. So, for example, in, in Cambodia, where I've been working for the last three years, if you look over the last 20 years, if you look at the access to maternal and child health services, um, if you look 20 years ago, there was a much bigger gap in access to those services between the richest people and the poorest. And what we've seen over the last 20 years through, through taking a primary health care approach, is we've, seen, we've seen that gap close. And so therefore we've seen dramatic reductions in maternal mortality and child mortality. So it is possible, but it, it is also difficult and it, ne it's, it needs to be a deliberative choice by governments and, and by societies. Thank you, Kumanan, very much. While you were talking, there was a follow-up question from someone watching us on Twitter asking who creates health inequities, how health inequities are created. Well, maybe if I could just add to what I just mm. said, right, um, in the, you know, inequality, inequity, this is not a new thing. We have been struggling with this since the dawn of human history. And I think, you know, some people would say skeptically, they're like, oh, well, this is just the way the world is. But we, we know that's not true. And it's not just about income level, right? If you look at income level between different levels of countries, there's more variation in life expectancy between countries of the same income level than between countries of, of different income levels. So there are countries that you know have relatively low GDP but have very good health outcomes. There are some countries with higher GDP that, that have don't have the health outcomes that you expect. And the same applies in terms of our inequity. So I think the thing we're always keen to stress is that when you say who who creates these health inequities, well, we do as societies through the choices we make, the policies we put in place, who we choose to benefit. And, and, and sometimes that can seem a little bit hard, but the good thing about knowing that these are about our choices, it means we can change those choices. And so when countries put in place policies, they put equity at the centre, it, it, it doesn't happen immediately, but we do see changes over time. We see improvements. The problem with that also is that progress isn't secure. So even if we do well with health inequities, if we then drop the ball, if we no longer prioritise equity, if we let some of our communities you know, not have access to basic services, not be able to participate, not count them, not respect them, allow them to be subject to discrimination, then we can see these inequities be created again, get worse. And so this is something we need to keep going at. Um, it's, you know, we know we can do it. We've seen countries at all levels do this, but it really requires an active choice at all levels of society and we all have a part to play. Thank you so much uh, for, for explaining and, and answering this question, Tidora. Um, most of the world's people experiencing extreme poverty uh, live in rural areas. Um, can you tell us more about the inequities that they are facing? Yes, definitely. And I'm really pleased that you're asking that question because um, our 13th general program of work has a, has a focus on leaving no one behind and reaching the vulnerable. And I think it's very important that we as WHO raise uh, the flag with regard to the, the most uh, poor and the, the people experiencing extreme poverty um, in terms of the 1.90 um, international cutoff or multi-dimensionally poverty and they they do live in rural rural areas um and it, the health of the rural poor is influenced by considerably weaker uh, health systems in many countries in rural areas uh, as well as adverse social and environmental determinants of health and so um we have uh, issues of uh, less strong health workforces so in rural areas, so not having the required health workers. That is a key uh, key issue for WHO, and now we're working uh, on guidelines to, to address that specifically. We're looking at also um, higher uh, issues with regards to um, a catastrophic 
expenditures or impoverishing expenditures in some rural areas as well. Uh, for example, impoverishing expenditures, a higher proportion of, of their income, uh, the rural poor's income is actually spent uh, for health and, and, and deepens their levels of poverty. Um, then in addition, we have issues of lack of available uh, ex accessible uh, essential medicines or health uh, inputs that are needed in facilities to ensure quality care. Um, when it comes to the determinants, we have issues of, of one in 10 um, health facilities globally, still in rural areas, they don't even have um, the, the needed uh, uh, water that, that is required to just basically ensure that there is quality services delivered. We need water in our health facilities for infection uh, control. Um, so just a basic thing like water is, is essential for health facilities in rural areas, but also for the population. When you look at the population, uh, the rural poor, that when you look at the people who don't have um, water and sanitation, it, typically they are located in rural areas. Eight out of 10 of them are in rural areas. Um, so these are the type of issues that if we're going to improve the health of the rural poor, we really need to look at integrated uh, rural development planning, the role of the health sector in that, incorporate a strong focus on One Health because the rural poor are more exposed to zoonosis. Um, so, so ensuring that uh, the One Health is, is uh, built in and preparedness measures are built into integrated rural planning. Um, and we need to make sure that other sectors are, are engaged in acting on the determinants of, of the health of the rural poor. Thank you very much. And uh, one of the asks from of these five asks uh, to um, deliver on health equity is actually to um, ensure that rural uh, neighborhoods and communities are having better access to health and, and social care uh, so that we can improve their, their health as well. Here is a question from a viewer uh, on Facebook, Jabindra Bandari from Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, asking how is WHO providing technical assistance to member states to enhance health equity and rights to health approach? What are the recent cooperation priorities in developing countries? So WHO provides um, assistance in a number of ways and maybe it's worth just sort of splitting it into the broad sort of approaches that we uh, need to do to uh, improve health equity. Um, firstly, WHO provides support around, around monitoring because you need to be able to understand the problem. You need to be able to measure the gaps between different groups of people within countries. Um, and so that requires what we call disaggregating data um, and so that you, you, you can understand that you have the problem. And that, that's challenging. I mean, many of our countries don't do that commonly. Um, so we need to improve our data system. So we, WHO works, our colleagues work uh, to support countries on how to do that, how to implement systems, how to think about um, taking advantage of the opportunities of, of digital health technologies. The second sort of thing, which uh, I'll sort of let Theodora has already mentioned, is actually working with the health system to make sure the health system does its job and doesn't make health inequities worse, which, may, which is essentially delivering universal health coverage uh, prioritizing the worst of making sure everybody gets quality services in a timely way that they can afford um, that, that meet their needs. And then WHO also works in thinking about how does the health sector work with other sectors to reduce um, inequalities in the social determinants of health, inequalities in power, money and resources. Um, thinking about how the health sector works with other sectors so that they understand their contribution to health and their contribution to health inequities and thinking about what are the key policies that, that can be put in place. So, for example, we have colleagues who work very strongly on, on issues around climate change. We know at the moment we have this emergency around COVID, but, but, but climate change is, many people say, is you know, the greatest public health emergency of, of the century in terms of its impacts now and its greater impacts into the future. So what can we do to mitigate and adapt to climate change? How can the health sector play its part? How can we really protect the worst off communities from the impacts of climate change? How do we work with, with the education sector? A lot of that work is, it's not the health sector telling everyone else to do. So WHO works 
at a country level, but also providing guidance on how to do the governance of working between sectors, having sort of joint accountabilities, monitoring between sectors, bringing together data sets from the education sector, from a sort of water and sanitation from the health sector together because often it's the same communities who miss out on services who miss out on infrastructure i i think one of the key things to note is that often people think about who in geneva but there are 149 country offices uh, there's six regional offices and and those offices work day in day out that's what i used to do in cambodia with with governments with at country level answering questions helping countries to formulate their strategies and policies, helping them with implementation, sorting out problems. And so it's in that sort of work, that's really where WHO is best placed to support countries um, to move on health equity. That's already happening. And through this sort of campaign, we'll, we'll accelerate those efforts. Thank you, Kumanan. Here is a here is a follow-up question, and maybe just just to uh, reiterate what you already said from our LinkedIn viewer: Are inequities not a manifestation of determinants of health? If that's the case, why do we just talk about poor performing health systems? Therefore, WHO's mandate alone can't address this. Um, well, maybe I'll talk about the determinants and hand over to Theodora to talk about the role of the health sector more, which I've, I've touched on, but it's very important. WHO's mandate, we're the World Health Organization, and as Theodora said, I mean, our role is to ensure people have the ability to attain the highest standard of health that they can. So it's not just about healthcare. And if you look at sort of key documents, key declarations where WHO has worked on through the years, through the decades since it was founded, um, you've seen that sort of emphasis. So in 1978, this very important document called the Declaration of Almirata that described primary health care there, it talked explicitly not just about the health sector, but the, how the health sector need to work with other sectors like education, water and sanitation that are so critical to health. Um, something that I worked on as a secretariat in the late 2000s, the Commission on Social Determinants of Health at WHO convened, which really looked across society about what was needed for health equity. So WHO's mandate is health, not just health care. But so the social determinants are crucial, and some people like to talk about social, cultural, economic, political, environmental, commercial determinants of health. Um, really it's saying the way we structure our societies, the way, the, what, the living conditions that people have. And so, yes, we do need to work on those. But the health sector has a very crucial role. If the health sector is not doing its job, it's very difficult to say to other sectors, you need to do these actions uh, to improve health equity. The health sector generates health inequity itself if it doesn't provide equal care. And maybe I'll hand over to Theodora to discuss a little bit more on that very important aspect of the health sector's role in reducing health inequities. Please, Theodora, Great. the floor is yours. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight that the, the components of the UHC declaration, which all of you uh, may remember from last year, are really, really centerfold in terms of the health, the health sector's role in tackling inequities. Um, and, and so we're looking at uh, reducing gaps in, in service coverage and we're looking at ensuring financial protection and financial protection is really, really essential um, in this current context when we have uh, poverty rates are increasing, inequality is going up. And so we need to make sure that we have a, a strong focus on on uh, ensuring that there are no affordability related barriers to services. Um, uh, that said, uh, I also wanted to say something uh, in response to the question that was raised uh, with regards to the cross UN role. Um, so, you know, WHO is the, the uh, leading and coordinating health organization within the wider UN system. Um, we do across the UN system uh, collaborate a lot for tackling inequalities and that collaboration is very important uh, to address the determinants of health. We have an inequalities task team. Uh, we uh, have had a leaving no one behind uh, task team as well. Um, and, and these uh, operate under a framework that focuses on, on really tackling inequalities and ensuring non-discrimination and leaving no one behind. And, and so through 
through each of the agencies working in our respective mandates on tackling inequalities, we can help deliver on action on key determinants of health. Um, and so, you know, WHO works both with regards to tackling inequities through the health sector, as well as promoting work on, on determinants of health. And then we work in close partnership with the other agencies like UNESCO for equity and education, uh, UN Habitat for equity and housing, et cetera. Thank you so much. And I thank you both for actually mentioning the Universal Health Declaration and Kumanan mentioned even the Commission on Social Determinants of Health because um, we got questions from Muhammad Nassar. You know, this is the first time I hear WHO talks about health equity among individuals and societies, and I feel that it's because the crisis is global. But why haven't we heard about it in the past? And what measures did you take to reach at least near this principle? So. You actually mentioned some uh, initiatives and work from years ago in this regard. So maybe maybe you can summarize what WHO has been doing before, not just now with this with this campaign in on health equities and, and determinants of health. So, so again, just to summarize, if you go back to the founding document, the constitution of WHO after World War II in the 1940s, very clear on the right to health and that that's for everyone. Right? It doesn't matter who you are, what your identity is. If you go to uh, the proceedings of the WHO Executive Board, which was one of the bodies that sort of oversees WHO in 1971, you'll hear this phrase, concerned by the increasing inequities between and within countries. And that discussion led to the work that led to the Declaration of Almorata in 1978, a real focus on health equity, on, on the right to health. If you look at the Ottawa Charter in 1986 on health promotion, a real sort of focus again on, on health equity. Um, every 10 years, we sort of re-celebrate the Declaration of Almorata, refocus on health equity. So. In 2018, 40 years of the Declaration of Almorata, the Declaration of Astana again says primary health care is still important. Health equity is core. That's what we need to aim at. The Commission on Social Determinants of Health, ch uh, chaired by Professor Michael Marmot, who, who spoke earlier today, um, again, was a three-year effort looking at what do we need to reduce health inequities. Just recently in the Eastern Mediterranean region, there was a commission on social determinants of health for the Eastern Mediterranean region, which followed commissions in the Americas, commissions in Europe. So this is a core value of WHO. And um, if people don't know about it, maybe it just shows that this campaign is very timely. It, across the organization, whatever program, whether people are working on HIV, TB, malaria, cancer, cardiovascular disease, whether people are working on air pollution, climate change, road traffic injury, people, equity is core to everything we do at HQ, at regional and country levels. But maybe we need to talk more about it so this campaign is very timely. And COVID-19 just shows we just need to do much, much more because it just shows what a huge problem health inequities are. Thank you, Kumanan. And Tia, please. Yeah, yeah, can I add in a bit there? I wanted to just share some of the tools and resources that we've been developing over the last more, more than a decade. Um, there's a substantial uh, piece of work on health inequality monitoring. Um, there's the, the HEAT, the Health Equity Assessment Toolkit uh, that exists. There's also Health Equity Monitor as an online database uh, with, with uh, data for many, many countries globally. So we really encourage everyone to look at that. Um, there is guidance on assessing barriers to health services. Uh, we also have a guidance for health program managers on conducting gender analyses and addressing gender norms, roles, and relations in the context of, of health programming. We have a tool called Innovate, uh, which looks at reviewing national health programs uh, to really adjust their theory of change so that the theory of change of the program tackles inequalities. Um, we also have uh, the work of the health financing team, which addresses financial protection for all. Um, our team working on uh, primary health care, uh, of course, as, as Kumanan was saying, this is equity is really centerfold in their work, but they uh, they also are, are now in the, in the 
uh, context of, of really looking um, with regards to monitoring and ensuring equity in their monitoring evaluation framework. We have a team looking at migration and health, so uh, tackling inequities uh, experienced by migrants and refugees. Uh, and then we, of course, have a program on disability and health with a range of, of uh, different tools um, there. And just a, a final call is um, in, in the current context, we really want to, uh, to pay attention to those who are experiencing the most acute inequities, uh, including those in humanitarian contexts in fragile settings. WHO has a whole work program uh, there and does a lot there. And um, this tackling inequities in these contexts are particularly challenging, uh, but very, very essential for all of us to keep on the top of our minds. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have more and more questions coming, so I'm just going to take a couple of more. Um, I'm very aware of the time, especially for Kumanan. Um, Ojeneku Felix from Nigeria, she's a nurse, is asking to what extent can um, health equity be um, attained and achieved in um, war and crisis-ridden regions? So, so as Theodora just said, I mean, I think it's a very important point. I mean, the the biggest challenges are in war settings and both uh, for countries affected by war, for communities within countries affected by war and conflict. And, and sadly, if we look at the countries that have made the least progress over the last 20 years in health, it is countries affected by war, communities most affected. So, so it is very challenging. Um, that said, there are still measures that can be put in place to reduce health inequities, even in these very challenging circumstances. So in the first place, in the way we deliver services in humanitarian settings, we can do that in a way still to preserve human dignity, that people, just even people in conflict settings, they still have a right to health. It's very challenging to deliver. Um, so the health sector there, thinking about how to deliver health services, primary health care, is, is still very important there, um, ensuring people are counted, um, ensuring that services that are delivered there, uh, thinking how to surge services into conflict settings, ensuring that health workers in conflict settings are, are protected because too often health facilities and health workers are attacked and killed in conflicts. And, and that just makes things even worse, not just for those families, tragedy for those families, but it reduces the services that are available to people in conflict settings. Of course, uh, the biggest determinant of people's health in a conflict setting is, is the conflict, is war. So beyond the health sector then, it's really how do we ensure uh, as a global community we support the ending wars, ending conflict. And of course, that's, that's very complex. That's far beyond the health sector. And But it's not just in keeping with all that we've been saying today, it's not just in the health sector. It's about the range of other services that need to be delivered still to people in conflict settings in terms of you know, safe housing. If people are in refugee camps, do they have safe housing? Are they protected from violence, including gender-based violence? Water and sanitation. Kids still need to have access to education. Now, we know that in conflicts, often those services are disrupted. It's very difficult. But we still need to assert and protect the rights of people to health to education, to water, to to having sort of to dignity in conflict settings. And it is possible. And, and if you look at the different conflict settings, there are better examples and, and then there are worse examples, which again show that the choices we make, the, the policies we put in place, that government has put in place, the international community is able to put in place, makes makes a big difference. Thank you very much, Kumanan. Theodora, any any additional comments from you? Yeah, sure. Uh, there are uh, rapid assessments with regards to uh, rapid vulnerability assessments in, in humanitarian contexts or crisis contexts. And uh, there is a way that they can look at barriers that are experienced by uh, different subpopulations in the crisis context. And that's very important because there may uh, these barriers may be uh, inhibiting the ability of these subpopulations to access the, the available services you know that are provided um, in the, in that in that situation, and so I think 
a, a key investment is is using those vulnerability and barrier assessments uh, to really understand who is at risk of being left behind. And uh, just to build on what Kumanan said with regards to gender, it's uh, ensuring that there is an integrated gender focus in those in those vulnerability and barrier assessments uh, to see how gender norms, roles, and relations are playing out and, and uh, to have particular attention to gender-based violence. Thank you very much. Here is one of the last questions from our Twitter viewer. It's already 2021. Why do we still have inequalities in health? Well, I, I think, as I said, you know, this is a problem that has beset humans throughout our existence, right? And uh, it, it is it is it is a political problem. We 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 think about how to create equality and to reduce inequity, not just in health, but across society. And what we've been saying today is that these are all linked. Um, so in as much as there are hierarchies, as there are these inequalities of power, um, this is something I think humans are always going to, to grapple with. But I think COVID shows us, I mean, you don't want to be try and be too rose tinted about this, but COVID shows us is that these inequities are actually bad for everyone. If we have these inequities that we do have in vaccination, it means we're going to have more and more variants. It means the pandemic is going to go on for longer. And it means everybody is going to be affected by that. So equity isn't just a nice idea it's not just utopian it, it's something that we need to strive for because it makes our societies better and for most of us it makes us it's just better off but if we tolerate societies where you know wealth is concentrated in a, in a very small group of people where decision making is concentrated in a very small group of people what we're doing is is that we're, we're denying the potential of our societies. It undermines our, our social potential, but also our economic potential. So, and, and I think even if you look at around economists, they're really recognizing this, that what we've seen in many countries is that we've seen increases in economic inequality, and that is actually undermining society's economic potential, let alone the social potential and, and the sort of uh, problems that causes when you have deeply inequitable societies. So I think the reason we still have this is because it's a very difficult problem and it's always going to be innate to the way societies are structured. But as I said, we, we do have examples of societies which are more inequitable than others. We have more and more resources, more wealth than ever before. We have huge challenges in terms of the environment and sustainability. So it really is now or never. COVID now, climate change really needs to impel us, governments, private sector, civil society, academia, international organizations, communities to take leadership and think about really tackling this problem of inequity. Health inequities are just a, a symptom of dysfunction in our societies and so we need to heal ourselves and put in place the policies that we, I think we do know work to not just prevent further pandemics to respond to COVID better, but also just allow everybody to have that dignity, everybody to have the right to health so that we can have flourishing societies, flourishing communities. And so people can fr flourish regardless of who they are, where they live, what job they do, what education they've had. Thank you, Kumanan. Theodora, in your opinion, why do we still have health inequities in 2021 and 20th yeah. century? And I, I just have to say, whoever asked that question, I really uh, appreciate that question because it's something that I've asked myself constantly as the years go by and I see the evidence and I see that the, 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 the inequities are, are persisting in so many places. Um, and and I think one thing that the COVID context has really done is it's, it's um, it's challenged us to be more accountable. Uh, it's challenged us to really think about um, which, what are the structures uh, that facilitate the continuation of inequities and how those structures actually need to be potentially changed and shifted and, and what are the accountability measures that we need to put in place to facilitate that. 
Um, definitely over the last uh, year, we've seen that very much with regards to um, ethnicity and discrimination based on ethnicity, um, structural racism. I, I think also the COVID context has really challenged us to be much more introspective about our own contribution. And when I say our own, I mean each organization, each institute, um, you know, each academic setting, uh, every government, and then and then also each of us as people. What what are our what's our role? And I think that uh, this is the 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 importance of introspection now to really see. Okay, what is in my power to do and what can I and must I do is essential. And then the last point um, in terms of, you know, why, why are we seeing these inequities still today and, and what would help us so that, you know, 10 years from now or, or 20 years from now, um, we don't see them. It's rethinking the metrics of what we value. And, and if the metrics of what we value um, hide the inequities, um, and and it's those are an afterthought. Um, then then that's it. we need to really question you know the 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 metrics of what 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 the metrics that we use to measure success. Maybe those are not the best metrics for uh, inclusive, sustainable societies. And that's something that the new um, WHO Council for the Economics for Health for All will look at a bit more. Um, it will explore uh, explore some of the issues with regards to investing in health uh, and getting the right metrics for that, um, and and seeing it as as something that good health and good health equity are are measures of success. Um, so I'm I'm very excited to see more of the outputs of that council and uh, and hope that they they help uh, advance us from where we are now, you know, still asking that question, why are we seeing health equities still? Thank you. Thank you so much. You also touched on what are the lessons from COVID-19 um, response because, and that was one of the questions we were receiving. Um, we're out of time and um, I thank you so much for finding the time and especially to you, Kumanan, in the middle of the night, staying with us and answering yeah. our viewers' questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone who is watching us from Belgium, Malawi, India, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands, US, Zambia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Algeria, Guyana, Tanzania, Switzerland, Brazil, Chile, Botswana, Kenya, Burundi, Portugal, Turkey, Cambodia, Bangladesh, UK, Sri Lanka, Aruba, Cameroon, France, Indonesia, Canada, Saudi Arabia, Philippines, Thailand, Sweden, New Zealand, um, there are other people awake, not just you, um, Kumanan. Uh, Mexico, Papua New Guinea, Austria, Afghanistan, Iran, Tajikistan, Uganda, Germany, France, um, and many more. Thank you so much. Happy World Health Day to all of you. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for asking your questions. Please stay with us on our social media channels and check the ads that our Director General issued uh, for all the people around the world to use your voices and votes to help us achieve a healthier, safer, fairer, and more sustainable world. Until next week, stay safe and uh, write us uh, with your questions and comments that we'll use in following sessions. Goodbye.